It's time for the Russ Belleville Show's Cannabis Q&A with Dr. Mitch Earlywine. Dr. Earlywine is a professor of psychology at the State University of New York at Albany and a leading author and researcher on cannabinoids and health who pins the Ask Dr. Mitch column for High Times Magazine. Get your questions ready in our live chat or call in to 971-533-7111 now. All right, everybody, welcome to our Cannabis Q&A. We've got Dr. Mitch Earlywine on the line. Hello again, Dr. Mitch. Hi there. Uh, we're having a great day here. Glad to have you here. And uh, we always like to give you the first word and let us know if there's been any breaking developments in the world of cannabis science. Well, that PTSD paper that I'm always complaining keeps getting rejected from journals finally got a revise and resubmit from a journal, so I'm pretty excited about that. The bottom line is people expect uh, cannabis to help with some symptoms but not others, particularly some of the re-experiencing and, and hyperarousal that folks associate with PTSD, they're less likely to uh, claim cannabis helps with some of the other symptoms. All right. Well, uh, so this re- release, uh, review and revise, you say, uh, what's the, st- I mean, after that, is it get published? What's the steps that this has to go through? Uh, I mean, they want a lot of statistical kind of wonky changes and then to uh, incorporate the DSM-5's PTSD definition more, and then they'll, you know, tell me what they think. It's no guarantee, but it's certainly further than I got with any of the other journals. All right. Well, that's good news. All right. I wanted to ask you a question here having to do with a story we reported today uh, on our uh, 420 Radio News, and this one, uh, researchers find chemicals in marijuana that could treat help treat MS. It looks like a follow-up study. They, they, in the story, they mentioned the 2011 study that's out of Tel Aviv, uh, Israel, where they, um, they paralyzed mice and then they gave them CBD. But apparently this is another study having to do with interleukin and all sorts of words that I'm not quite understanding. Can you give us the breakdown on what's going on with this MS and cannabis study out of Tel Aviv? The bottom line is we've got some of the best cannabis researchers in the world right there in one of the smallest countries in the world. And these are the same folks who, you know, first cloned the, the CB1 receptor, who first identified THC and all that stuff. And as it turns out, the mechanism behind cannabis' uh, treatment for MS tends to be poorly understood. What they've discovered is that, in fact, some of the uh, CB1 receptors are involved But there are some other pathways as well, and that seems to be how CBD is working, and one of them involves the substance interleukin. Hmm. All right. And uh, one thing I found interesting in the study, it said that uh, they gave mice THC or CBD, and they seem to find results with both. Uh, What is that telling us? Well, the curious thing is is that there may be multiple pathways to this same uh, ending uh, problem and ending solution. So... Uh, the CB1 receptor and the THC involved certainly seems to be, be helping, but this interleukin pathway, CBD, doesn't really fire up the CB1 receptor in the same way or much at all, really, uh, suggests that there are, in fact, two pathways. So we're not only learning a lot about cannabis as a medical treatment, we're uncovering some really intriguing things about MS itself. Hmm. Amazing. And of course, we know so many patients uh, using uh, cannabis. And and of course, it's just anecdotal reports, but they tell us all the time that it it does wonders for dealing with the the fiery tingling of the skin and the the drooping effects that they have. It's just amazing. Oh, and the crazy neuropathic pain and then some of the general fatigue uh, related to an inability to sleep. No, it's, it's really a medicine that they need to have access to. All right. Well, we've got some questions coming in in our chat room. I also have a question that came in via email from Wayne, who uh, cites uh, Dr. Carl Hart from Columbia University. And and I just wanted to say personally, uh, great to see Dr. Carl Hart getting a lot of FaceTime on the media. He's one of our our best researchers out there uh, who says that drugs do not cause addiction and calling into question this uh, disease model of addiction. uh, The questions he wanted to ask were basically... um, Basically, why aren't all drug users addicts? Is it because people, not the drugs themselves, determine if they're going to be addicted? Is there some component to which the drug does make a difference? He's kind of asking a lot of questions about that concept. Sure. Well, as Carl has asserted, and in fact, going all the way back to my old pal Stanton Peel, who wrote a book back in the 70s called Love and Addiction, what we're discovering, in fact, is, yeah, there are individual differences in, in human responses to drugs, and those help predict who's going to at least use more regularly and who might be at risk for problems. But what we've been ignoring all along 
are these incredibly important situational contributors. So folks with a lot of socioeconomic status problems, folks uh, experiencing a whole ton of stress, and more importantly, folks who don't have alternative reinforcers, other things in their lives that are rewarding besides drugs, so they don't have a good educational system, they don't have good opportunities at work, they don't have strong relationships with friends or family or things like that. Well, what a surprise. They're also at risk for problems, in part because drugs are by far the most rewarding thing they have in their lives. Hmm. Uh, a follow-up on that, he brings up, uh, why is there no dose-dependent relationship between drug use and addiction? Some people can drink lots of glasses of wine and never become an alcoholic. For others, they drink one glass of wine and bam, they can't stop. Why no dose-dependent uh, relationship? Uh, the clincher, in fact, is more the presence of alternative reinforcers. My mm -hmm. student, Boaz Levy, has done a lot of work on this, Chris Correa down at Auburn, who shows that if you find something else rewarding, too, then, in fact, the link between dosage and problems is really not there. But if you've got nothing else in your life that's reinforcing, you've got no buffers against drug problems, then, sure enough, we see this large linear link between frequency and quantity of use and drug problems. Hmm. All right. Well, let's go to our chat room now where we've got a question from Runaround666. Who wants to know what is the normal board working on? In fact, I just got an, an email from Paul Kuhn. We're talking about more fundraisers, uh, trying to make the most of the money that we do have, and uh, generally uh, strategizing about uh, ways to take advantage of both research and uh, political opportunities in not only Colorado and Washington, but other states that are considering either medical marijuana or legalized. I know as far as events go, the uh, the Key West Legal Seminar is coming up in the first weekend of December. I'm actually going to be down there in Key West and do a little bit of coverage of it for the second year in a row. So this job ain't so bad. Um, uh, the board was very grateful with last year's, by the way. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And uh, the other uh, uh, point I wanted to make, uh, Normal's got that Super Bowl ad going. Do you have any updates on that? Uh, alas, uh, we've got pretty much their last thing that they put out is sort of the situation we're in. We've gotten a ton of press about it already, <clears throat> so I feel like that's a step in the right direction, but we don't uh, have a Super Bowl ad guaranteed in hand right now. Right, right. And that, and that's, uh, you know, I have to think that if there's any point at which humans become involved that get to decide, you know, like a small cadre of people at, at into it get to decide, well, then forget it. We're not going to get a Super Bowl ad about marijuana. But the fact that the people want it and it keeps going so far, that is a win in of, of itself. Exactly. I feel like the press we've gotten in some ways is, is almost as good as a Super Bowl ad. And boy, I, I have to admit, I've had a dream about having a Super Bowl ad. <laughs> Me too. All right. Reefer Rob would like to know, can cannabis exacerbate social anxiety? Yes, it turns out some of the strains, particularly the sativa strains, and especially at high dosage, social anxiety does increase, uh, particularly in a subset of folks who are a little on the self-conscious side anyway. Uh, in truth, we've got splendid 12-session treatments for social anxiety, and a lot of folks respond well to just the old self-help books on social anxiety that often uh, really focus on just social skills training, making sure you're a little more comfortable with the hi, how do you, teaching you how to... Uh, be a better listener, and then suddenly it's amazing how these folks really turn around. All right. And I uh, want to remind everybody we're taking your questions through our chat room or on the phone at 971-533-7111. But if you don't want to be that public about it, you can go to 420radio.org, visit our contact page, and there's a drop down there that'll say Ask Dr. Mitch, and you can send it in by email like Wayne did. Uh, a lot of people prefer it to do it that way, and that's perfectly okay with us. I have another question I wanted to bring up just as I was Thumbing through the news, I got this uh, story out of Deseret News, uh, which, of course, is Salt Lake City, Utah. And the uh, the headline here is DEA fears flesh-eating drug could end up in Utah. Well, that's pretty scary. So this is the uh, story of Crocodil, uh, this uh, drug that has some pretty, pretty nasty side effects. I've seen some of the uh, YouTube pictures of this. What can you tell us about this Crocodil and the DEA's fears? Alas, I, I, uh, I feel like any drug that has the potential to create some of these symptoms, and it doesn't look like this is just a manufactured bunch of nonsense, we, we do need to be fearful of. 
is this the product of cannabis prohibition? I don't know. I, I'm sure uh, anyone would rather uh, turn to cannabis than a drug that could potentially create all those crazy symptoms. But to call it flesh eating may be a little bit of an exaggeration, and I, I don't want folks to uh, sort of then never believe anything else they ever hear in drug prevention programs simply because this is a little bit beyond what the data we have. Uh, nevertheless, the, the clincher here is always know uh, your source and by all means stick to the plant that's got the 5,000 year history of safety. And I'm wondering because, you know, we've been through a few rounds of the faces of meth campaigns that the law enforcement brings up about methamphetamine abuse. And I seem to recall some studies showing that much like the scare about crack babies, a lot of this really had to do more with the, you know, socioeconomic conditions and, and such than it really did the use of meth. First of all, am I right in that remembrance? And second of all, could crocodile be something like that as well? Well, all this stuff so far has been confounded by, uh, you know, some meth addicts living some rough lives on a number of different domains. So it's not just meth, but clearly the meth was not helping them. Mm -hmm. And then I think the, the deal with the crocodile it's too early to tell. It's just too early to, to make any predictions about how that's going to run. And it seems to me that uh, if I'm understanding the reports correctly, that the people who are seeking out the crocodile are people addicted to opiates like heroin or Oxycontin and unable to get that. They turn to the cheaper available drug that rots their leg off. S sad but true. I'm, I'm afraid this is a product of, of that uh, opiate seeking behavior. Those drugs are really harsh. They can really grab hold of a subset of people. So uh, mm. by all means, uh, use them with caution, if at all. All right. We have a question from Lively Libra in our chat room who wants to know if there's any update on the menopause and concentrates connection. I have been working anecdotally on it religiously. So Mallory and I submitted everything to the IRB. The IRB sent something back to us, splitting some hairs about the way we're a asking questions. And then we uh, jumped right on it, sent it right back to them, and so we're, we're waiting for the ethics board. Okay, okay. And uh, looks like someone in the chat room is listening and asks, uh, you know, this is an interesting question. Does meth help anyone? Uh, unfortunately, smoked stimulants really don't help anyone. There's a, a situation and a number of stories about meth uh, during wartime that a few people have said, you know, actually, if I hadn't had this... It, it really did save my life and, and all that kind of stuff. But it was orally administered, low-dose, uh, single-time events that are incredibly rare. In in talking about that issue, sometimes I speak with reformers who say, well, it's just, you know, it's just like Adderall. It's just like these others. But, I mean, how much difference is there between prescribed amphetamine stimulants and what we're talking about, street meth? Uh, generally, it, it's all got to do with the rate of that blood drug curve. So uh, with meth, we're talking about getting really high really fast. With orally administered uh, prescription drugs like Adderall, it's markedly slower for a markedly longer duration. Is there so the much opportunity in, for harm is just much less? I'm sorry. Is there much uh, in chemical composition that's different though between the drugs? I mean, uh, no, not really. Not really. Okay. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Amphetamine's amphetamine. What can I say? Amphetamine's amphetamine, and that's what is interesting to me in how much we demonize the users of the street amphetamines, and yet we overprescribe the Adderalls to the kids. It's just, it's really confounding to me. Uh, I mean, the, the, our, our history with the stimulants, uh, Rasmussen has a great uh, book about it just called On Speed, and he really goes through all the history on that, and, and yeah, you can see we've had a love-hate relationship with this since ancient times. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, it's kind of an all-American thing as far as our Calvinistic work ethic, and the more you work, and the more you, more productive you are, kind of, I think, drives people toward that in some some respect. Oh, I agree. All right. Well, Dr. Mitch, I want to thank you so much for joining us every week here in our Cannabis Q&A. And folks, if you didn't get your question in this time, just tune in next week. We'll be right here. We'll see you later, Dr. Mitch. Thanks for joining us. Have a great week, Russ. All right. When we come back, we're dedicating it to the King of Pot, Mike Malta. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. of the marijuana nation. Ever wonder how often to change your bong water? The most effective method for making